the heart of what Christians celebrate and proclaim is a verse from John that deserves memorization and frequent recitation and meditation. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. What is the world that God so loved? Is it an ideal place where everyone lives in justice and peace? Is it an Eden where sin is absent and humankind lives in harmony with itself and nature? God would certainly love such a world, but unfortunately, it doesn't exist. Does God love the good things that happen in our world? Justice and peace really do occur. God's beautiful creation is appreciated, is protected, and has its harmful effects softened or prevented. This is a world where love among peoples and worship of God actually happen. Perhaps God so loves the good things about our world as to send the Son as a reward to those responsible for that goodness. However, that is not what the passage says. It says, the world, without modification. The world God loves is this world, the one in which we actually spend our lives. It is a world of injustice and discord, as well as of love and cooperation. It is a world where there seems to never be good unmarred by pain, stupidity, selfishness, weakness, hatred, sin, and death. The good news is that God loves the world as it is, not as it could be or should be. What makes this good news is the fact that we are part of that world so loved by God. We do not have to earn God's love. We have it, bad as we can be, to the extent of God sending the Son to save us from whatever keeps us from experiencing that love in its fullness. Does this seem to be a strange message for Lent, a season to reflect upon repentance and our need for salvation? Shouldn't we be gloomy in order to set off the joy of Easter? Isn't it a few weeks too early to be hearing such incredibly good news? Later in the passage, there seems to be an opening for a bit of gloom. Whoever does not believe is already condemned for not believing in the name of God's only Son. Does this mean that we're saved by believing in a single word and damned for not believing in it? Are all those who do not know the word Jesus doomed? The pitfall for those who look to scripture and other church teachings for knowledge of God is what theologians call objectification. It's the tendency to treat the words of scripture as if they were a checklist, rather like instructions for flying a plane or baking a cake. However, they're more like poetry and should be read that way. In the Bible, one's name is the equivalent of one's self. To believe in the name of Jesus is not to make declarations regarding how the neighbors called him. It is to accept what he really is, perhaps without ever hearing the word Jesus, the condition of most men and women alive today. What is he then? That brings us back to the overall theme of his words to Nicodemus. He is the love of God made present among us. He is the source of eternal life offered to the whole world because God loves the whole world. To accept his name is to live in the love of God, not refusing any of the gifts God offers us, whether we know the donor or not. Lent is the season when we prepare to renew our baptismal commitment in solidarity with those being baptized at Easter. It's a time of preparation to rededicate ourselves to proclaiming to the world the good news that God indeed loves us now, here, as we really are. God's love will not wait or depend upon my repentance. That love will not make any demand upon me except that I accept it. That love will not even be overcome by my death, and so is the source of eternal life. Can I really believe that? I can easily believe that I must repent, but it's harder for me to believe that God loves me whether or not I do anything to earn it. God loves me not as I could be or should be, but as I am, 
even I don't do that. 